there are 12 regional reserve banks concentrated in the East and the Midwest. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve controls and coordinates their activities. The board is made up of seven members appointed by the president. Even though there were 12 regional banks, Wall Street soon ran the show. As president of the New York Fed, Morgan protege Benjamin Strong seized control of the board's open market committee operations. Strong would remain the dominant force at the Fed until his death in 1928. The Federal Open Market Committee, now based in Washington, directs the Fed's most important instrument of monetary policy, the purchase and sale of government securities on the open market. To increase the supply of money and credit, that is to inflate, the Fed buys government securities from a few hand-picked firms with newly created money. To tighten money and credit, the Fed sells securities. In this, it can act on its own discretion. Every government wants the ability to create new money. Okay? It's an alternative to raising taxes. Taxes, as we said, when they're raised, tend, tend to be, evoke a lot of um, uh, uh, resistance among the public. It's much less painless to increase the money supply. The effects, um, the, the negative effects, don't occur until six months, a year, two years later, at which time the increasing prices can, can be blamed on other factors, the weather, um, speculators and so on. Another device the Fed uses to control the amount of money in circulation is setting the discount rate. This is the interest rate charged to member banks when they borrow short term from the so-called discount window. If the Fed lowers the discount rate for its loans, commercial banks will likely borrow more from the Fed. This increases the amount of funds banks have to lend. Bank credit thus becomes cheaper, as reflected in lower interest rates on bank loans and credit cards. The increase in funds available for banks to lend also increases the amount of money in the economy. The Fed can also manipulate the nation's money supply by raising or lowering the reserve requirement. Banks are required to set aside a percentage of their deposits as reserves to meet depositors' demands. When the Fed was established in 1913, it cut reserve requirements in half over the next four years, doubling the money supply by the end of World War I. But the Fed's real power lies in its monopoly to create money. Although the U.S. was still on the gold standard in 1913, it was quickly eroded as the Fed continued to expand the money supply. The first step was backing Federal Reserve notes by only 40% in gold allowing the money supply to be increased two and a half times. The inflationary effect of fractional reserve banking was also heightened by the central bank. The commercial banks are permitted to create checkbook money on top of Federal Reserve notes. That is to say, the commercial banks are only obliged by law um, to hold reserves in the form of Federal Reserve notes of 10% to back all demand deposits that they have. 90% of their demand deposits are backed by nothing. The Federal Reserve System adds another inflationary layer to an already unstable banking system. For example, if the central bank has $100 worth of gold reserves in its vaults and a 10% reserve requirement, it can print up $1,000 of new notes and deposits, which become the reserves of the commercial banks. The commercial banks take this $1,000, and if they're required to hold 10% again in reserve, they can multiply the $1,000 into $10,000 through fractional reserve loans. So an inverted pyramid is created with $100 worth of gold or real money at the bottom, and $10,000 of inflated paper money at the top. As this $10,000 in new paper money circulates in the economy, it drives prices up, therefore reducing the buying power of ordinary citizens. When they spend that money, the people who get the new money first and are able to, to buy products with it uh, benefit, and the people who get it at the end lose because when they go to spend it, prices have already gone up and so they're able to buy less. And so there's a transfer of wealth and of power uh, from some segments of the economy to others 
because of the actions of the central bank. And basically those who benefit are uh, the government itself, uh, big banks, and government contractors, and uh, anybody who's closely associated with the federal government. By making enormous amounts of credit easily available, the Fed can also drive down interest rates, sending out the wrong signal to investors. It sets in motion an unsustainable investment boom that carries with it the seeds of its own destruction. It's this business cycle that is ultimately responsible for economic disasters such as the Great Depression. Soon after the Federal Reserve was established, the U.S. entered World War I. Once again, the government temporarily abandoned the gold standard to print more money to finance the war effort. The U.S. government borrowed heavily, and the national debt ballooned from $1 billion to $27 billion. A sharp spike of inflation followed. This set off a cycle of rapid expansion and contraction in the economy. To dampen the overheated economy, the Fed halted its inflation, causing interest rates to nearly double over the next 18 months.